such a powerful and touching film and deeply disturbing. So we are fortunate to have the filmmakers and um, also one of the experts in the film with us. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. You can tell us what you like about your background as we go. And then I know we have a lot of questions. I am not surprised. So lots to discuss here. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, I'm Helena Hansen. I'm uh, interim chair of the psychiatry department here, interim director of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. I'm also an anthropologist and someone who is very glad to see critical perspectives on the way that we practice psychiatry. Boy, do we have a lot to learn and a lot to improve in our field. So I just want to thank you again for such a moving, moving film. Okay. Like to sell that. Yeah, I, I guess I should start. I just because everyone always asks. Please introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Lynn Cunningham, <laughs> co-director, co-producer of the film. Um, and I think our DP and um Joan Churchill is here and Alan Barker, who's was head of all the sound, and um a lot of uh, now kudos to them because a lot of those great scenes are because of those two up there. Um but I wanted to just, because I always get asked this question about the inspiration for the film, and it was to help a uh, beloved family member, an accomplished scholar and athlete who in her 20s um, began to, well, we were told she had a serious mental illness. She um, started, uh, well, in, in 10 years time, she was on 10 different medications. And um, it, what was called, we were told she had a chemical imbalance. Um, and the questions that came up from this were, it, it just didn't, it didn't make sense because she had been so full of life and so accomplished. Um, and one drug seemed to lead to another and another and another. And um, it was called, it, 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 now the term is um, medication cascade, but I didn't know it then. Uh, but it just didn't make sense to me. So I, um, you know, I had these questions, you know, why was she taking so many medications? Why were her diagnoses changing every time she saw a different doctor? Um, uh, were the drugs themselves part of the problem? And um, of course, I, I, this, these are the questions that drove me to do more research. Um, I read some fantastic, there's just a body of incredible um, work out there one book by my fellow panelist, David Cohen, um, uh, Your Drug May Be Your Problem. Um, I learned about these drugs and about um, and the potential for causing real harm, which I'd never known about, neither did my family. Um, and uh, I read Robert Whitaker's Anatomy of an Epidemic. Um, uh, it, it, in it, he lays out lots of stories, case studies, that all had the same pattern. Um, people who had taken these drugs um, and whose symptoms had worsened after taking them. So um, I just thought to myself, this could not be true. This is our standard of care. What is going on? Um, but as I witnessed my own family members, despondency and her um, suicidality and her real spiral downward um, into dysfunction, I thought, well, maybe maybe something is to it, and joined with my co-director, co-producer Wendy Ratcliffe, and we interviewed hundreds of patients um, around the country, many who were in um, the emerging online support groups and chat rooms, um, and the, so the internet does have some, does have something to do with um, the emergence of this film. Um, but from those interviews that we conducted. Um, the, the, we, we started to piece together the film. Um, but thank you, UCLA. I really, I really thank you for showing this film because it, it, it's really important to note that this film is not meant to deny anyone's experiencing taking or prescribing successfully psychiatric drugs. Rather, um, it's meant to 
promote informed consent. Angie says it in there. Informed consent is giving the full picture about what might happen should you embark down this road. Um, it also, and this is what's really, really important to me, introduces the concepts of physical dependency and protracted withdrawal um, to an unsuspecting public. Um, my fellow panelist, Peter, and longtime friend will detail his own grueling experience um, with withdrawal. Um, it's important that Peter is here because what happened to him is happening to many, many people. Dave Cope in our film. Um, the societal dialogue that we hope to inspire with the film must include people with lived experience. Um, anyway, now I'll hand it over to my fellow panelists. Yeah, David, who's a pioneer this in the field? Should it be this order? Or it doesn't. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to start with? So Lynn's film, you know, beautifully captures uh, people with lived experience. So I, I'd rather sort of spend more time being available to answer questions than talk a lot. But just very briefly, um, I took uh, an antidepressant for 22 years. Um, I took it because I had a hard time enjoying life. Um, I had stresses and, I, you know, um, and honestly, when I started taking it, I think it had some benefit. Um, uh, but I took it for way too long. Um, I was a, a, you know, the sort of the medical profession was exactly what you saw in the film. You go in for a 10 minute checkup every six months. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. And they would just sort of keep you on the dose. Nobody ever suggested that taking a medication. I mean, I should have known better, but nobody, no psychiatrist ever suggested to me that taking a psychiatric medication for a long period of time could create a dependence, that there could be difficulties getting off, et cetera, et cetera. About 20 years in, I think in hindsight, a lot of what I think and understand is probably hindsight. I started waking up early with anxiety and eventually sort of concluded, well, maybe this drug isn't working. And my wife, who I'm very grateful is here today, said, well, you know, I've always been a little nervous about you taking a medication for a long period of time, but if it's not working, why would you stay on it? Um, and that made a lot of sense. And so I did go to my psychiatrist or the psychiatrist at the time. And he said, oh, yeah, if you want to get off, you know, you could probably do it in six weeks. Well, I was taking Effexor, which is probably the hardest antidepressant to get off. I think it was absolutely close to criminal to recommend that I try to do it in six weeks. I'll never know what would have happened if I'd taken two to three years, but that's what I think I should have done. Um, and I crashed um, when I got off. And uh, I basically spent five years in hell, you know, and I uh, eventually, I, it, it's very odd coincidence. I reached out to a friend and was talking to him about what I was going through and said, do you know, you remember Lynn? And we were friends. We had been out of touch though. I said, Lynn is making a movie about what you're experience. And so Lynn and I reconnected and I saw the movie five years ago when I was just in the beginning of this. Um, and it, it well, I mean, I, I eventually connected with some of the online forums and we would talk, we would, I mean, it's hard. I had everything and I have everything. I have a loving family. I had a job that I liked. I, I don't have major financial concerns or things like that. And I woke up every morning pretty much wanting to die. Um, uh, I was in agony. I was in physical agony. I was in psychological agony. And unfortunately, a lot of what happened, and to the extent there are doctors and psychiatrists here, what, what compounded a lot of it was the lack of belief. Statements like, oh, well, you know, you took an antidepressant because you were depressed, so that you just it's coming back. Well, I had never been suicidal when I was younger and when I started taking an antidepressant. I lost all motivation. I mean, even when I wasn't terribly happy, I've always been a very driven person. I, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't care about anything. And they're like, well, you know, you know, sometimes when you're older, the depression's worse. And I just, I kept thinking this can't be true. You know, I went to law school and did really well. And now I don't give a shit about anything and I don't want to do anything. And I used to love riding my bike and I made myself go out and ride my bike, but I didn't really want to do it. I just lost interest in life. I'd wake up, the mornings were hell. I was sleeping about three and a half hours a night um, as someone who, you know, used to sleep, well, you know, sometimes as much as 10 hours a night, but, uh, you know, I, I and the lack of sleep was agonizing. Uh, I would wake up to a dark house knowing that my family wouldn't be awake for four more hours. 
and I'd be in physical agony. Um, I had burning nerve pain, the likes of which I'd never, I mean, I'd never experienced any, I'd never experienced burning nerve pain at all. I would take freezing cold showers at two in the morning to try to cool my body down because I was in such pain. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I don't want to do the whole litany because people who go through this, they have different, you know, I luckily never had tinnitus, but I connected with people who had tinnitus, which is just, it, it make, drives them crazy. I didn't have that. I had the burning nerve pain. I had the insomnia. I had the profound depression and suicidality. Um, and, and as I said, one of the hardest things, and we're at a medical school, but if I would say to doctors is believe people when they tell you these stories, believe that this is what they're experiencing. Don't tell them that this, oh, well, it's just your old depression again. It wasn't my old depression. It was something completely unlike what I'd ever experienced. And, you know, and, and they, but they also, they, they, if they heard evidence that didn't support their theory, they just ignore it. So I'd say, well, wait a minute. I, I know you say, well, this must be just your depression. And sometimes when you get older, the depression get worse. How do you explain the fact that I feel like my skin has been cut open and people have put live wires under my skin and I am burning pain and I, and I put cold compresses on my chest at two in the morning and they would just kind of not respond to that. And I would think this has no relationship to depression. This has no relationship to anything I experienced when I was younger before I got on psychiatric medications. So believe your patients and, uh, and I mean, my God, you know, I, one other thing I'll say is when I said, when I did go back to the first psychiatrist before I realized this is a bad place to be, he was like, well, I've never heard anything like this before. And I, you know, I actually believe that maybe in his subset of patients, he hadn't experienced that, but I just wanted to scream at him. But I'm talking to thousands of people on the internet who are going through this and you don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. How can you not? Even as David said, this doesn't happen to everyone. I also talk to people who got off, you know, cold turkey off benzodiazepines without a problem. So I don't think we have any understanding of why some patients and some people go through these and things and others don't. But it's a loaded gun for some people. So you better be aware of these risks and you better be aware and inform your people before they get on these drugs of these risks. And if they are telling you they want to get off, you really better be aware of it's an incredibly dangerous process to go through. I was a competitive athlete for many years. I don't think I would have survived if I hadn't experienced sort of grueling training for about 15 years and I wouldn't have survived if I didn't have the support of my family. Um, and a lot of people aren't lucky enough to have those things. It's that hard and it's that bad. So um, I'm really glad that Lynn's made this movie. Thank you. Um, hi, so um, my name is David Cohen. And of course, I'm in the movie, which reminds me that it was. So maybe use this one. I should use this one. Okay. Oh, that's better. Uh, um, first of all, well, it's a movie, so it was seven years ago, I believe, and the spring uh, 2017, I see, I remember the students in the class, so it, I didn't know exactly when it was filmed now, I can understand, seven years ago, or six years ago, uh, and a, a lot has happened since, I think, in many ways, but the movie, as I see it now, and it's the first time in two, three years I've seen it from end, beginning to end, I really like it. I think it says so much. And I think almost every single assertion would stand the test of rigorous checking or, oh, these people are exaggerating. On the contrary, I think everything that is said by the, you know, the experts, so-called experts, of course, and all of us who are all in the same boat together, and, and everyone in the movie is saying exactly what was happening to them exactly what could be checked and confirmed everyone is saying exactly what's been going on and what was going on then what's what's different the only thing i could think is that oh maybe there's understanding of a different relationship of the dose of the drug in your body to uh to the way it releases so that uh you know to the way it, it leaves your body so that when you're withdrawing you can take big steps down at the beginning of the withdrawal and those steps have to get smaller and smaller and smaller at the end of the withdrawal. So the smaller the dose uh, that's left in your body, really, that's active in your body, the smaller 
the decreases, if you will. That's the only thing that people might say is the working model today. It's called a hyperbolic relationship, let's say. So that's the only thing that wasn't mentioned then, but it's just a tentative hypothesis. That's not been really tested either, but it's the only thing that people talk about who are interested in this notion of uh, how do you get off prescribed drugs that you've been taking every day and that you're taking every day. So, so it's really an amazing movie. It's really a textbook. It's, I, it's truly, truly, I, I, you're part of it. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes, but um, that's the issue. Is again, it's it's so it's so on target, for lack of a better word. So I'm I'm really impressed with what you did. I'm, I'm sorry to exaggerate and repeat myself, but this is a darn good thing you did so long ago. You put it together, and I when you were telling me uh, during our interviews what you wanted to do with it, I was thinking good luck, meaning that there's no way. And in a sense also, um, I don't know who's watching right now at home, but it is a medical school. It, uh, uh, Dr. Slusser mentioned in the introduction that this is only the third medical school. I thought there were more. I really well, thought there were more. That, there were that more who have bought the copy of the film from our, our educational distributor, Good Docs, right. and we hope that keeps going. But okay. this is the first Q and A at a at, at, a, at a school yeah. in a medical um, a school setting. The third the Q and A. Yeah. So that's you know, well, I don't know. Is it good? Is it bad? It doesn't really matter. But it should be more, and there should be more of these Q and As. What else can I just say briefly that maybe might advance? So there's a context in which all of this is taking place. It's a medical school, but there's a context of, and we're hinting at why is it that a number of, of authorities in, in the field of psychiatry, Thomas and Sell, Alan Francis mentioned here, so many others who have continually kept looking at the population data and said all the population indicators around mental health, around well-being, are off. It's just getting worse and worse over the last 40 years, let's say, kind of coinciding with the mass scale medication. But even mass scale medication, that's always taken place. There's always been ups and downs and cycles with the barbiturates, the LPAs at the beginning and so forth. It all goes in a cycle. So there's always a bunch of people that are being given by their doctors drugs to relieve their pain, their to deal with their life problems. The big change was when we began to say, you're not taking drugs just because you want to feel better. We're going to give you drugs that we know that we understand because there's something wrong with you. And those drugs are going to fix that. So there's been a kind of a, uh, an upheaval, a, 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 um, a kind of um, um, turning on its head, the notion that, yeah, I can take this drug because I, I'm not sleeping or something, and I'll see what it'll do to me, and then I'll make a decision about what to do with it later. That was kind of shifted out, and we had now authorities tell us there's something wrong in your brain or wherever, sometime, somewhere in the construction of your body. We know it's there, but we can't find it, but tomorrow, tonight maybe, we'll know exactly what it is. But we, we, and that has been the tale that you don't know yourself, you don't know how to use these products that have been used for thousands of years. Um, and, but we know. And so then you were forced to enter into some kind of, sorry to say, it, cult of drug use. And, and so you couldn't get out of that because you were, with that cult came the authority, I'm the doctor, I've got science behind me, and then the power of the drug industry. So there's a big context. There's a lot of money, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of ideology, a lot of myth that sustains all of this. And yet it's these individual people, we have to handle it all ourselves. It's, you know, Peter had to figure it all out by himself. And so this is the, the fact, it's a very big deal but everyone has to handle it by themselves and they have to relearn again what's going on and they have to meet all this resistance out there. It's really terrible. So is it better? I'm not sure. Is it worse? It's hard to tell. It's going in different directions. There's a lot of hope, more information, more people, more films, more textbooks, more guidelines. But there's also a lot more people that are just pushed headlong again into medicating. 
into being medicated, into medicating themselves, diagnosing themselves, diagnosing others. It's all cultural now. It's really part of everything. So it's hard to be hopeful. And it's hard to have to tell someone, you know, inform yourself. Ultimately, it's back to you. You work it out while the system keeps going as it's going and dispensing and producing and looking at those quarterly earnings at the, you know, at, at the end of the day. And that's what decides everything. It looks like that. So I'm, I'm here to say what a great movie, but I am pessimistic, though I'm an optimistic person, as everybody who's who says I'm pessimistic follows when I'm optimistic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have questions starting to pile up and I'm, I'm beginning to figure out how to package them together so that we can get through them. Um, I feel compelled to say just a couple of words because I have been in the field of psychiatry, let's see, since 2005. So that's going on 20 years now. And um, the thing that comes to mind is, number one, we're at a crossroads right now. There's this nationally declared mental health crisis. There's an infusion of money into mental health with the, the likes that we haven't seen before. And um, so we're kind of at a pivotal point in mental health. We're also at a point where medical students are now choosing psychiatry at really high rates. It was one of the most popular specialties of our last few graduating classes. Psychiatry is becoming a competitive residency, which it hadn't been before. Why do I bring this up? Because I'm thinking about psychiatrists as number one, um, really contending with a feeling of being marginalized within me medicine, kind of an inferiority complex along with um, many decades of defunding of some just basic mental health care. You know, we are seeing the impact of defunded community mental health, of closure of state mental health, mental hospital beds, but without any backup plan, the whole de institutionalization story. Um, mental health has not been a big priority or been taken seriously. And I think that what that did was it left psychiatrists very vulnerable to the pharmaceutical companies who absolutely came in and offered a way to elevate our status, to elevate our pay scales. What did we lose in that Faustian bargain? A lot of skills. Learning how to talk to people, learning how to sit and talk with people and hear them out and actually become a useful part of figuring out life problems. We gave that up. So um, we have been de-skilled. And even in my own program here at UCLA, I talk with residents all the time who say, we're not getting good psychotherapy training. You know, please, you know, what can we do? And there isn't money in psychotherapy. It's very, very tough. You know, there isn't that kind of big pharma lobby behind psychotherapy. And that's not being reimbursed by the healthcare system. Really ridiculous limits on the number of psychotherapy visits, if you get any. And uh, that means that more and more mental health practitioners are being channeled to that medical side of things where you can get the 10 minute visits in and charge a lot of money, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that we are definitely as a field experiencing that history and that set of bargains and loss of a lot of what we may have had in the past. Um, and we're at a crossroads where there is now more government money being poured into mental health. What are we going to do about that? Do we even know what we don't know? I'm not sure. Many of us don't know what we're missing when we go through a whole training in mental health without getting psychotherapy training or psychotherapy ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> which we often need to just even understand what it can do. So I would just want to thank you for this film because it comes around at a really good moment. Uh, I'm ashamed that more programs haven't invited you in with this film for a conversation that we desperately need to have. All we can do is start working with our colleagues on this. Right? <laughs> start working and pointing out that there's something not right. We know as a group that there's something not right in our field. Something is missing. And we're burning out. We're burning out and dropping out of clinical practice because we're not able to help our patients. We're missing something. So, um, so I just want to thank you and also say that it's, it's so important to listen to people with lived experience, 
um, and to people who have critical perspectives. When I was at NYU until three years ago, we were able to bring in um, representatives from this organization in New York called the Icarus Project that um, is made up of people with lived experience who have a very critical lens on medications and who've developed a lot of self-help tools like a guide to weaning yourself off of psychiatric medications, which by the way, that was not taught in NYU's residency program. We did not know how to taper people off. Except we, it was all about how to get people on. So, um, so we do need to listen to people with lived experience and people with critical perspectives. And that's what this film it helps us to do. I don't want to, yes, and thank you for that. <laughs> so before uh, I take up all of our time here, um, so I'm going to kind of lump the questions together thus far. They keep coming in. But one set of questions has to do with what do we do about big pharma? How can we push back? One, one version of this question uh, says, could there be a big pivot, much like what happened to big tobacco? holding the companies accountable, pressuring the government to take action. So I'm curious to hear what each of you thinks about what can be done. I have some ideas about what could be done about big pharma in terms of, let's start with its involvement into the testing of the drugs that it manufactures and sells and markets. So there have been many calls to have an in independent, say organization publicly funded to test evaluate the drugs, the efficacy of the drugs, uh, as the FDA does now. But the FDA doesn't do its own testing. The FDA just asks a, a drug company to produce a study according to certain rules, and then it evaluates the study, but it doesn't test things itself. And then it gets paid. There's a member fee. So if you're a manufacturer, you pay the FDA. So it's really, it's all like the you know, the the construction of airplanes or missiles or drugs, it's all, it, everyone uh, participates, collaborates, works in the industry, then comes to work in, in the agency that regulates the industry and they keep moving back and forth. So this is what you get with, with the drug, with big pharma. Everyone moves in the same circles at, at the top and they end up like kind of uh, deciding policy, a lot of money. There's a lot of money that goes to the uh, legislatures. So this is all the lobbying money. Tons of it, and the legislatures therefore get their priorities uh, uh, enunciated for them, and they vote for the laws and the register that says how the drug will be tested and how many cl how many clinical trials will will count. Do you need to have a an a, a positive trial versus a negative trial, and so forth? All this is in the federal register, voted by legislators who are paid by big pharma to exactly uh, uh, follow these rules, so they you know can get reelected. It's all kind of connected that way. It's not just a scientific issue in the sky. It's all written down, and this is what the law does. It's all legal. So we, you know, it's about, I guess, voting. <laughs> so that's one one way to to contextualize a little bit. But you know, other ideas, of course. Uh, I I think it's got. To be, I mean, I think big pharma. It it does it does do good things too, and and we can't forget that. But I think that it's going to be it's going to be a grassroots. Mm -hmm. awareness and once the general public which was what we were trying to do is a, is more aware and once they start partnering with doctors and listening to each other um like what peter was saying i i think that it will be uh, it will be led by the grassroots and big pharma will adapt mm -hmm. um and also the insurance it would be so great to have some of these wonderful alternative uh programs that do help like therapy or um nutrition uh, there's one one great psychiatrist that we interviewed and she was the only one in her medical school class who took the course on nutrition mm -hmm. and there's all this stuff about the microbiome and there are more serotonin receptors in the microbiome than in the brain and yet no one's taking courses on nutrition so i just think psychiatry needs to reinvent itself it needs to adopt all the other methods that make people feel better mm -hmm. and um and people need to become more aware mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, oh yeah i don't have a lot to add i mean i'm very I'm using the microphone oh, just sure. for the people on zoom thank yeah, you absolutely. i mean honestly i'm very pessimistic because i, I mean i agree with lynn it'd be great if the insurance companies were paying for alternative uh, i know alternative is the wrong word at some level yeah uh, I'll, other I'll, kinds of yes. treat, alternative has a sort of sense like it's woo woo and we don't really <laughs> believe it but other kinds of therapies 
but they cost more. I mean, I, mm -hmm. and so it's a, you, a system where a doctor meets with you for 10 minutes and gives you a pill, most of them, which are now generic. So they don't cost, you know, I'm with Kaiser, they don't cost Kaiser much and so on. Like that's an easy system to keep going. Um, it's a much harder system to say, we're going to, you know, invest in, in some of these other things. So I, I'd love to see more of that. I do think it is a grassroots thing. And I do think it's, you know, you have to have doctors listening mm -hmm. to patients and doctors reading. There's, I think still the preponderance of the literature is not suggesting that these drugs are probably, or can be super problematic. I, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a scholar, in this, but, yeah, but right. I think that there's more coming out. So I think we can change at the margins. I wish I said I, 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 I'm optimistic about a, an enormous change. I'd love to see it, but I'm, I'm not sure what the dynamics are that, that bring that about. Mm. Right. So I, I'm so glad you mentioned nutrition. Another thing that I learned by accident when I was in psychiatry residency was that there are all these studies on exercise yeah. and we never prescribe, we never encourage our patients to exercise. It's such a basic thing. Primary doctors, care doctors might do so. Yeah. Psychiatrists rarely do that. And then I learned that in New York City, when I was where I was practicing at the time, there are huge discounts for people in the park and rec system to join the gym, you know, and they're now increasingly insurance companies that will pay for gym membership because there are so many benefits, so many health benefits. That brings me to one thought, pay for performance, right? This idea that perhaps we should be reimbursing healthcare practitioners based on how are their patient populations actually doing? Not what are you prescribing or, you know, what are you doing in the office, but how are they doing uh, with their health? Could we maybe tap into that impulse um, to look at nutrition, exercise, um, joining of organizations and clubs, see, you know, places where people can get social support, along with psychotherapy. You know, there are just so many things, you're absolutely right, that we're missing. So thank you for that plug for holistic approach. And in fact, along those lines, that's another kind of category of question. Um, and there are more and more of them popping up. More questions here. So I'm trying to keep up. Um, many about withdrawal people wanting advice on how to do that. <laughs> um, well, the, with, there are, there's inner compass. There are, if you, if you Google with, you can find these uh, support groups. A lot of them know a lot about how to properly taper. Um, there are um, in the benzodiazepine world, Benzo Information Coalition, um, there's Benzo Buddies, there's Surviving Antidepressants. I mean, these are very, very responsible um, organizations. Yes. And, um, and you mentioned the um, Inner Compass Initiative. I yeah. think it's called, they have something called a Withdrawal Project, which is an online resource. And um, several thousand people are involved in this sort of work together, mm -hmm. helping each other to uh, to get through difficult times. Uh, yeah. I wanted to add something about uh, maybe a, a, a sort of a broader perspective about the the fact that people it, in the work that I've done with uh, with people who are trying to come off psychiatric drugs, I've concluded tentatively that if you believe that you have a mental illness, then you will always believe you need treatment for it. And that treatment probably is something physical because you also believe that mental illness is physical. It's, it's in your body, it's inside you and can't control it. So somebody else has to control it for you and they know better. And so the, the people I've worked with who could somehow emancipate themselves from that idea had, a, had an easier time. Definitely, I would conclude they had an easier time to get off their drugs. And the, whereas the people that just always knew that I'm mentally ill, it was just, even if it was mentioned to them in for 15 seconds one time, but it was some person they trusted or so, you have this, it's lifelong. It could have been said for five seconds, maybe. It stayed with them forever and they couldn't shake that. And those people had a really hard time getting off their drugs. This is a you know personal conclusion, but it tells me that what was is sold is not drugs. It's these ideas, these diagnoses, that there is something called mental illness, and which is what the original critical perspectives were about. There is no mental illness, but today, my goodness, we can't even we, we couldn't say that we you know it's it's we 
will be laughed out of the theater. But this is the question. What is this? What are we suffering from? What is this about? Is, is there something qualitatively different from uh, of, by being crazy than just being completely distressed? You know, are they the same? And so on and so forth. So it's, it's all these questions that are behind this urge that, you know, we need to go see, as someone in the movie, I think, said at the beginning, maybe Mary Vietton, mm -hmm. you go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So you have this, this pain however you want to call it, it's coming from somewhere and you go to the doctor because who else is going to handle it? And so, and the doctor knows one thing, they'll prescribe a drug to you because they're a doctor. That's what they do. Only they can do it, by the way. Remember that. There's that whole, that's the elephant in the room too. Only they can do it. Only they are allowed to do it. So even that the whole monopoly prescription system has to be looked at. How come they prescribe it what what do they do in return for you not being able to access it directly what is it what is the trust in that relationship or the responsibility they have what do they offer to you if something goes wrong that's the that's why we give them the power and so it is a really important question and the people in the movie and many others say i didn't get anything from the fact that you know i was given the drug and given the problems with it and that's all so that part of the relationship to that relationship is broken for many people. So we need to look at a lot of different areas to see, you know, what to do. Just add one. I'm going to make an unpopular statement in the medical school. I would choose to get my information about getting psychiatric off psychiatric medication off the internet a hundred times before I would trust almost any psychiatrist or doctor. <laughs> there are almost none. Yeah. And then you go on the sites where there are lists, uh, you know, are there, is there some doctor in my community? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the lists are, you know, as long as one finger, mm -hmm. you know, there are people like you who actually really have done a lot of this and understand it. And they're very few. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a weird thing to say, because I know there's a lot of shit and crap on the internet. But the reality is that the people who are by and large the experts are also on the internet. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are saying you've got to do it incredibly slowly. And here's how you develop a tapering plan. And you know, here's how you do it using dissolving your pill in water, or here's how you do it cutting through using a scale and, and a razor blade. The doctors don't know that. Mm -hmm. And the psychiatrists we're not don't we're know not that. training you're not, people yeah, in that. You're not trained for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a lot of curiosity. Uh, no, obviously, I don't want to make this. You know, not no, all psychiatrists are the same, not all doctors are the same, not all lawyers are the same. But in general, what I found when I met with psychiatrists was a lack of knowledge and frankly, from a lot of them, a lack of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the tensions in making the film um, on our team uh, was that we did not want to doctor bash because we didn't see the point of that. We thought there are so many good doctors out there and there are, they may not be we can't, we may not find them, but I have faith. I'm an optimist that they are there. Um, so I forget who it was. Maybe Angie um, gave the advice on one panel, you know, do not just go to one doctor. You must go and interview doctors. You must ask them, okay, what is this going to do to me? I want proper informed consent, but also how long do you think I will be on the drug? Because many people are saddled with prescriptions that last a lifetime. Peter, 30 years or 20. And, you know, you heard Ivan, the pharmacist, at least with benzodiazepines, they're not, they're two weeks, but I have many friends who have been on them for 15 years, you know, and they, so the interview with a, a doctor or a psychiatrist would be, what's, what's the exit plan? How long will I, are you going to medicate me? What are the side effects of the medications? And then what is the plan to get me off? And, you know, can you lay that out for me? I mean, that's just very yes, simple. Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm also thinking, you have me thinking about medical training because the way that medical training is organized right now, we're not getting inputs from the right types of experts. <laughs> and in fact, what I learned, I, I decided to study social science because I wanted that critical perspective of explaining how did we get here? Why do we practice the way that we do? And I discovered that a large part of the marketing budget that was cited in the film actually goes to unbranded advertising. What that means is they selling sickness, 
In other words, um, marketing a diagnosis in advance of a newly patented expensive medication that happened with Prozac, for example, that the, the very idea of depression as a diagnosis was really amplified in general, you know, magazines and popular media in advance of this medication that uh, the manufacturers knew could be prescribed by primary care doctors, and it would be a game changer for the size of the market. So people who had originally been maybe diagnosed with anxiety or something else were starting to get depression as a diagnosis, and be, they were prescribed Prozac and other uh, SSRIs, other drugs in that class after that. Um, and so where does that kind of critical perspective, that understanding come from? Social scholarship, like historians, social scientists, anthropologists, anthropologists and that's exactly what we're lacking in medical schools. So that's one reason I sought out that kind of training and, and I've been advocating with a growing network of my colleagues to bring that kind of knowledge into clinical training so that we can, now really, because we, we actually don't know where these ideas come from that we're being taught. Um, and it's very hard to have another vantage point from which to understand mm -hmm. what's happening without history, without some study of the institutions and the policies that are shaping what we do um so on yeah go ahead no no i crazy like us i think it's crazy like us the book i yes. forget his name but he he is sent by a pharmaceutical company to japan to ethan waters ethan waters to japan to introduce the word depression which wasn't even in the japanese language and it is absolutely fascinating to read how the disease, the name and the label and the diagnosis had to come before the drug. Yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. So on that note, if we're thinking about a way out of this closed circle, <laughs> um, we have a form of question. This is, this is just one version of it about what about long-term recovery? Can anyone speak to grief, loneliness, identity, reintegrating into society? You know, what do we do about that? Once we take the, the magic bullet of the medication out and we're left with the problems of human life, what can we do? What can we offer? Um, yeah, I, I have the answer. Um, well, I think community, community health, I think we need to work on um more face-to-face -face time with each other. I mean, now we have a few more people in this auditorium, but when we arrive, there are about four people here. And I we know there are a lot of people watching virtually and thank you all virtual watchers, but why aren't we coming? And I know COVID was a horrible thing and we're, we're rebounding from that, but um, more face-to-face -face interaction and, and helping our children do it and helping our elderly do it and not sequestering ourselves at home behind screens. I think would help loneliness a lot. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. There's something creative about loneliness too. Yeah, loneliness. It's, uh, you know, it is, it has always been the task of, of people to somehow, we do have to get back to ourselves and figure it out ourselves. I mean, it's the task of any critical thinker at some point you've got to, so, uh, you know, it's not just, okay, it's all together, we'll work it out. Yeah, of course, like-minded people, that's the only, you know, safe space in the world is people that you can share things with. But besides that, some things you just have to do uh, by yourself. And uh, there's, not, there, there, there's no other way. You have to, you know, look at the idea in front of you and, and break it apart or wonder if it's good for you. And who does it really serve? So this is like critical thinking. This is, you know, this is like the task of the 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 enlightened person. This is what the the, the enlightenment thinkers suggested that every person has to do at some point for themselves. So we do, we do paradoxically have to go back to ourselves at some point and go through this this darkness and then and then meet like minded people. So I don't know if I'm making any sense right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would just add that it is part of, and I know there's a shortage of time and money and whatever to for, to give therapy, but I think part of a therapist's job is, I wish I heard more of this when I was younger, is it's okay to be in pain, you know, that yeah. is, or, or, you know, somebody, something bad has happened to you. It actually kind of makes sense that you would be in pain um, and that there are ways to get through that. 
but that's part of it. it's just you can't just medicate it um and you shouldn't just medicate it um that is part of life um now look there are times of suffering and so on and, and situations where i think probably medicine is appropriate but i think it, we're just too quick to say the idea now that so many kids are on medication I think I probably would have been medicated because I was a little bit difficult in grade school. Mm -hmm. And now I think they probably would have said, well, you, you know, you're, 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 you need Ritalin. Mm -hmm. I was lucky not, that wasn't so common when I was growing up, but the idea, no, I was just sort of a bit of a pain in the ass kid who thought he was smarter <laughs> than my teachers from, you know, day one, but I didn't need to be medicated. And I'm glad that I wasn't, but the idea now that we see this as a problem, that's what some kids are like that. It's not a problem that needs to be medicated. But I think that doctors have to be willing to say, mm -hmm. this is part of life. You're suffering. Yet, yeah. mm. understandable, your father just died. You're suffering. Right. right. And that's hard. But you can work through this. Yeah. Don't numb it. So on that note, I see we're we're low on time and there's so many important questions flooding. And I thought I'd combine two of the last questions here. Um, one is a statement that there's a clear point being made that mental illness is not, quote unquote, real. This is highly problematic. So I bet that you will have lots to say on that, that issue. Uh, and then the second is that the approach or attitude towards psychiatric drugs, is it different in other countries? You know, I think it's useful to look abroad to see how could it be otherwise. Um, so I wonder if maybe we could bundle, bundle these together. Them. And if, if you could comment on the concept of um, neurotypical versus neuroatypical identities. Wow. Just, you know, to build off of what you're just saying about the kind of kid you were, um, it's just a language that my own children use that I don't think was around when I was young. Yeah. Um, I forget what the, the middle question was. The, 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 countries. Other countries. Yes, other countries. Is, is mental so, illness yeah. real? Yeah. So, well, think of COVID, what COVID did. It illustrated to everybody that things that happen to you screw you up. If you're isolated, if you're alone, if you're cut from uh, normal sources of reinforcement, if you're uh, locked up, then you get very uh, anxious and upset and depressed and angry and irritable and so forth. So this is, everybody understands that things that happen in your life can hurt you and make you very upset. So I don't know why we now see maybe uh, instances of rises of uh, distress and everything as signs of people are mentally ill, but things have happened to them. So if I suggest that mental illness is not real, I'm saying that it's just a word. Suffering is real. Pain is real. Trauma is real. Stress is real. And reactions to all these things are very real. They're, they're ex, you know, extraordinarily real. What mental illness is tells you it's something that is uh, medical in nature or that the solution, it implies in there that you need to see, say, a, a medical doctor. And that is maybe the question. Maybe part of this mental health crisis that we're talking about suggests that there are many different ways to deal with mental illness. And there's more openness to that than just the medical solutions. On the other hand, we see more coercion, especially in California, and we see more just talk of everything as genetics, genetics, genetics. And so it's just kind of, it's going in different directions. In other countries, what's really different is how we deal with children. Every culture has a way of raising children and involving the schools or the parents or not. And so that's what we see in relation to drug use. Few countries stand out with very, very low drug use, but very high use of the medical system, like France or Italy to some extent, have very low psychotropic drug use for children, you know, about one fifth or one sixth of, of what's seen in the United States. And um, certain drugs are just cannot be prescribed before a certain age, which is not quite the case here. So we you have these, each country's culture interacts with the, the marketing system of drugs and the educational system and its traditions, and then the medical system and its traditions to produce a particular kind of, you know, bundle of when will a child be introduced to a medication, for what reason, and for what diagnosis, and so forth. So it does vary dramatically from country to country, but over time, the sort of Hollywood U.S. lifestyle, you know, you know, which lusts after unmedicated people like a, a lumber company lost, lusts after forests, then, uh, yeah, everybody gets, it becomes the same thing. But there's still a lot of variation around the world.
definitely. Yeah. My understanding is, and I don't know how the sort of these guidelines translate to what's happening on the street or in, in doctor's offices. My understanding is the British are ahead of us in terms of both recognizing withdrawal as a very severe problem, having guidelines about, I mean, my understanding is still psychiatric guidelines in this country are still, you know, get off in two weeks mm -hmm. and the British are more aware of the scope of withdrawal and the guidelines on how to withdraw. I, my also understanding is that I, I read, and I'm not sure this is right, but I thought I read that they, the new psychiatric guidelines are that people with mild depression, the first prescription should be exercise. It cannot be medication, mm -hmm. which is not the case here, clearly. So um, I'm not saying everything's hunky-dory in Britain. And, and again, I don't know how that translates to what's actually happening, but my understanding is the guidelines are considerably better there than they are here. Thank you. We have the film is... We've made four different foreign, we've made an Italian version, French, Spanish, and German. And so we're about to launch those and we'll, wow. we'll get back to you on that. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it'd be fascinating to hear how the film lands or resonates yeah. in other countries. Yeah. Any parting thoughts for us before we log off? Thank you. I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank been you. such an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.